I'm absolutely delighted to be chairing this conversation between, uh, and I don't use these words lightly, two of the world's leading thinkers on education, teaching, and change. Pazzi Selberg, on my far right, is a Director General in the Ministry of Education in Helsinki, in Finland. He's experienced in classroom teaching, training teachers and leaders, coaching schools to change, and advising education policymakers around the world. And over the past decade, you will all know that Finland has been cited as one of the world's most successful education systems, characterised by high attainment, high equity, and exceptional standards of teacher performance. John Hattie, on my immediate right, is Professor of Education and Director of the Melbourne Educational Research Institute at the University of Melbourne, one of the world's leading proponents of the use of quantitative evidence to drive change in education. And his book, Visible Learning, called by the Times Ed, The Holy Grail of Teaching, presents the results of a synthesis of over 50,000 research studies on achievement. Now, what we want, insofar as it's possible in a room this size and behind, t behind this table, is for this to be a conversation, a conversation on stage, but also a conversation across the room. So I'm going to ask John first and then Has uh, Pazzi to spend a few minutes setting out some of their key ideas about high-quality teaching and learning outcomes. I'll pick up a couple of things with them, and then we'll try to make this as open and free-flowing a dialogue as possible. So, John. Thank you, Chris. The topic we're given today is what makes great teaching, and I understand great teaching to be related specifically to high-impact, passionate teachers. I've got to the stage of my career now where I don't care a damn about teaching. I've given up on it. I think it's the wrong debate, it's a perfect distraction, and quite frankly, it allows us to ignore the issue. It is about the teachers who have that impact. It's about the impact of teaching. It's not about teaching. And that requires those who are involved in having an impact on teaching to be at least aware in many possible ways about their impact. And let me deal with the two parts of what I think great teachers are, that is high impact, passionate teachers. Firstly, the notion of passion. I'm not referring to passion in terms of just the love of the job. I'm going beyond that. I'm certainly not talking about it in terms of obsessive passion, like we have obsessive gamblers and obsessive social butterflies. And I'm talking about harmonious kind of passion. A passion that involves teachers who see teaching as a really important part of them as human beings, where they worry about the concentration full attention and the flow of the, of the classroom and the activities. And they constantly seek ways about how to improve their own impact on their students. In my job, I get to go into many schools, into many classrooms, and I certainly see the evidence from many thousands of classrooms throughout the world. My best guess, given I haven't spent a lot of time in the UK, but my best guess from looking at the evidence here is that I think there'd be about 30 to 40 percent of the teachers in your school systems which would meet that criteria of high impact passionate teachers. And my point is, they are around us. They are here. And what I struggle with is how we can then build on this coalition of success that's already out in our school system. Why is it that we allow the debate to be about between schools? I mean, the biggest issue facing our profession is within our schools. These teachers obviously, who have this high impact, this passion, it's about the students. Hey, I've got news. Students don't necessarily come to school to invest in this thing that we call schooling. Certainly we argue in our, our new book on thinking that the mind's actually not designed for a lot of thinking. Thinking and learning requires a lot of deliberate actions, a lot of deliberate practice, a lot of deliberate attention to what we don't know. And to me, it's about uh, how you get these high-impact, passionate teachers trying to engage students in activities that they don't necessarily want to participate in. It's a hell of a lot easier to use those resources, to do non-thinking things, and we see those constantly in our world at the moment, both in our classrooms and our video games and so on. And it's not laziness. I think it's the nature of the human mind and how we turn kids on. And passionate teachers turn kids on to what they feel is they are passionate about. Now, I want to contrast this with the deficit model, where we see students as problems to be solved. 
in need of more knowledge, in need of more tests, in need of more keeping quiet. And if only we had more time, more resources and fewer of them, we could make a difference. If only they had financially gifted parents. If only they didn't bring their personal problems to school, then we could make a difference. That's not what I'm talking about. Great teachers don't assume that. They certainly assume all students can make the growth that we expect of them. Let me turn to the other half of the equation, high passion, uh, passionate high-impact teachers, the high-impact notion, because it's more than passion. Now, when I talk about impact, is I'm talking about magnitude. I'm talking about how big is the impact. If I've learned one thing from my visible learning work is that if you take the 260 million kids I've now got in the sample over a thousand meta-analyses, one thing I do know is that everything works. If you set the benchmark of saying, can I improve a kid's learning, it's almost impossible not to. Which is why every teacher can say, just leave me alone. Because they will have evidence they're improving learning. It's why every politician can wake up at night and come here out on the stage and announce a new policy. It will work. If your standard is, I can enhance kids' learning. What fascinates me is that's not where the bar should be. How can we enhance kids' learning? It's can we get it above, in my terms, an average effect, my jargon, 0.4, that's the detail. How can we get there? And the story is quite different when you look at those teachers who have high impact up there compared to those who have high impact below the average. And that's what drives me. So my normative claim to you today is that high impact teachers also have quality evidence that they're having that high impact on all their students. So here's the, here's the dilemma, folks. If it is the case, as I would argue that we have the basis of a coalition of success already in our school system, how come we have a conspiracy of silence about excellence in teaching? Where is the professional body of high impact educators that not only advise government, but they temper and help implement good policies? Where is the Royal College of Teachers, the, technical, the Teachers Professional Board? And let me note, I'm sorry, that teachers are amongst the first to lop off success. They are the ones that, whilst they can see they're high passionate teachers, too often, when it happens, they give the students the credit for being bright, for putting in the effort, for doing the homework and so on. They don't attribute the success to them. And this great equalisation we have in our profession, quite frankly, is killing us. If we don't recognise ourselves that we can have high impact. When I notice, for example, that uh, brand new student teachers within a year all want to be and claim to be perfectly okay at the top of the rung, something is wrong in our profession. What chance have we got if we continue our debate about our schools and the the structure of schools and not about what we do in them. What chance have we got when we fill up our schools with more adults? For example, in the, UK, in the US in the last 20 years, the student population has grown by 17%, the teaching population has grown by 35%, and the non-teaching adults in the school has grown by 48% and nothing has changed. We obviously favour bulk over excellence. So my point being is that I would argue from there is a practice of teaching, there is a narrative improvement. There is excellence all around us. And certainly my argument has been we should have, every kid should deserve at least a year's growth for a year's input. And I think we know what that looks like. As I'm sure you've heard in the previous talks this morning about the international debate that's going on, what you talked about, Chris, the globalisation. When I look at Finland, for example, and I'm going to put a challenge here, and the challenge is I could be wrong here, Parsi. Before I hand to you, I see a system which has an improvement mentality. I see in Finland a system not afraid to recognise and welcome expertise and excellence. I see a system which embraces and listens to high impact teachers. I see a system which creates safe incubators to drive up the quality of, system, of, of, of teaching. I see a system that wants to continue to accelerate improvement. And here in the UK, as you wallow just below about the, national, the, the world average, just below the US, we are my estimations that you're about an effect size of one below the, the top schools in the world, which means that right at the moment, every single kid in your school should be two years in advance of where they are if you're going to get in that top five. More of the same is not going to do it. A coalition of success, a coalition of improvement is going to make the difference to make sure that we esteem that, whole, that notion of high impact, passionate teachers. Your turn. Thank you very much, John. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. Good afternoon. How are you?
Can you all hear my voice? No, you can't. One, Try again. Two. All right, okay. Thank you very much, John. Uh, actually, I wanted to start also by introducing a little bit my country, Finland, because it was not mentioned this morning. There was Poland and Singapore. And <laughs> but you know, Finland is up there very north of the European Union. And we, are, we are very small, and I know that many people think that we are kind of an outlier, but just like John was saying, that we, uh, I think we have done some, some interesting thing, things. We trust our teachers, we don't test our kids to death, and we dance and play as well as we learn academics, and I think that's a kind of an interesting thing to see. Let me just make uh, three quick uh, uh, comments on related to this question of great teachers. The first one of them is that how, when, when I look around the world, what's going on in, a, in a classrooms, and, and particularly at the level of education policy, is that how the global educational reform movement that I have described in my, in my text and in my, in my book, also known as GERM, is creating a condition for great teaching or teaching in general. And GERM has elements like increased competition that is often uh, lowering the, um, the moral, uh, the moral uh, purpose of, of te teaching and teachers, uh, focusing on uh, uh, prescribed uh, outcomes and results and, um, uh, and measurements. Standardization is another kind of a, a symptom of GERM where teaching and learning seems to be more standardized and people are now using these teacher-proof uh, strategies where basically anybody can come and teach and just following the, um, the prescription. And, and thirdly, the test-based accountability that is a very well-known and, and visible symptom of, of the global educational reform movement that is uh, holding teachers and schools more and more accountable for students' learning and everybody knows what the consequences of that are. There are three interesting kind of, a, uh, uh, how would I say, infections that are coming from this global education reform movement that are directly related to teaching. The first one, and these are all, these are all examples of how our policy, education policies and reforms are viewing good teaching and good, uh, good teachers nowadays around the world, really. I'll give you three, three examples. Uh, direct, these are direct uh, quotations from the uh, policy uh, documents. The first one says that, the quality of an education system cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. This is something that McKinsey uh, put forward five years ago in their report, and now it's used all over the world. People think that you cannot have education system better than the quality of its teachers. And I think the problem here is that it, it, it's almost like looking at like Man Manchester United or Real Madrid as a football team and saying that they cannot be, they cannot play better football than the, the, the quality of the, the players and everybody knows how the reality is that it's a team play, just teaching is a team play just like a football or any other sport. The second example says that the most important single factor in improving quality of education is teachers. And of course this is, a, this is something that John has been uh, investigating in his, um, in his studies as well. But there's also research that is saying that the, the in-school uh, factors count only 20% of the variation of students' uh, achievement as measured in the test score. So it's only 20% and the teachers are just part of this 20%. So all the rest uh, uh, that in influence students' learning and uh, achievement comes from somewhere else and not from teachers. So we can take a note on this. A third one, third example says that if any children had three great teachers in a row, they would grow academically regardless of their racial or socioeconomic background. Again, this is a commonly used uh, argument in, in, in the policy texts. Uh, for example, the No Child Left Behind legislation and, and related do documents uh, frequently talk about these things. The growth here is measured only by using standardized academic tests. So it's no, no other, there's nothing about arts or trauma or social studies related to this. What the studies related to this notion show that they, the, um, and, and this is where I find the the most difficult thing to accept something like this is that somebody who is a great teacher, a good teacher one year, can be a poor or ineffective, ineffective teacher the other year, depending on the conditions and pupils and school where they are teaching. So this, to be a great teacher seems to be not a kind of a consistent uh, uh, thing. So, so let me close by making a reference, and this is, a, uh, this is a actually getting back to, to great work that John has been doing on on visible learning and, and visible teaching. When Finland was working on the 
what I would call a great educational reform in 19, 1990s and uh, moving the uh, authority of curriculum planning and uh, asses student assessment also to the schools. We were, we were looking very closely at the meta-analysis and research on good learning, not, um, not only good te how good teaching looks like. And we identified, at that time, this, this is already uh, 15 years ago, we identified six things that were kind of a driving ideas also in the philosophy of setting up the Finnish, um, Finnish curriculum and teaching and learning. The three are, I'm not going to talk about this too long, just mention this. The three first ones are that the learning has to be goal-oriented, it has to be contextual, and in other words, situated in the, in, into the kind of a real-life setting, and it has, learning is uh, cumulative. So in other words, the new learning is built on the, what the students already know. And this is all what you can find in, in, in John's books as well. But then the three things I think related to good learning are interesting because these indicate to how teachers could be uh, teaching or should be teaching. The first one is that if we believe that uh, learning is, uh, if we believe, the, if we believe that the, the cons constructivist approach to learning is something that we should follow, then the first one is that learning is Good learning is active construction of knowledge, knowledge and meanings uh, out of uh, experiences. The second one is that good learning seems to be self-regulated. So if you are a great teacher, you should be promoting these, uh, these qualities. And thirdly, the learning, good learning seems to be somehow so, uh, uh, promoting social interaction, or co cooperation or collaboration. And, you know, if you use these indications of features of good learning as a uh, guidelines to answer the question of what is the great, great, how does great teaching look like or what is the great teacher, I, I think we can find these things, uh, things over there. So, what is great teaching then? I think we all, we all agree that the great teaching and great teacher is somebody and something that focuses on these features of good learning, what we know about good learning. It's something that is focusing whole child rather than a kind of aspects or, or fragments of a child. And it's something uh, that, uh, again, John is talking about passion and love to learning. But if I bring the Finnish context into this, the experience that we have had during the last uh, history about good teaching and good learning, I, I think I would li only like to add here in the end that good teaching and good teacher is something that shows that the teachers are trusted, that we have to trust teachers and, and rely on their judgments. The other one is that I think we have to pay teachers well before they can be great teachers and good teachers. And I'm, I'm not referring to any particular country, but in some places teachers are heavily underpaid. And thirdly and finally, I think that the other public policies have to make more contribution to the well-being and happiness of children before we can expect that there will be a general good teaching and good teachers in our systems of education. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you both very, very much. I'm, I'm going to open this up um, as quickly as I can. I just want to ask two questions. And the first is this. You've both talked about passion, moral purpose, and the capacity of the teaching profession to improve itself and to drive, to drive change itself. So my first question, and I think it follows on from the first session this morning, is what does the teaching profession do about politicians in a hurry? Well, John, do you want to get... Sure. C certainly the kind of system that I would want to promote is the notion of having a professional body of teachers who could temper politicians mm -hmm. in a hurry and actually could do the opposite. They could help implement when they also want to do the hurry. And we must be one of the few professions that don't have a Royal College of Surgeons, etc., <coughs> and so on, that doesn't mm -hmm. do that. And until we actually start as a profession to do that ourselves, it's going to be done unto us. And so that's my despair. Mm -hmm. uh, and I certainly know that the, most of the politicians I've met would be quite happy to talk with that group. I also think they should fund that group. Um, yep. And there are too many... So it's like some of the sessions I've been to this morning. We talk in war stories and anecdotes, and we've just got to stop that, because that's killing us. Okay. Pazni? Politicians in a hurry. What do we do about po politicians who are desperate to change at speed? Because the Finnish transformation was a long, slow transformation over 30 years. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think we, in many cases we would be much better off if the politicians would leave education alone. And, and then, and, uh, again, this is, this is not a notion for any, any particular country, but sometimes uh, 
you know, I came from the United States yesterday this morning, and there several people there were asking uh, that can you compress the time of education reform? And these were all politicians who were asking these questions. That can you turn around the education system or teaching profession in three years? And uh, simply, you cannot do that. And, okay. and that's why I think that the, if you look at the kind of a time span of any uh, realistic education reform, like Finland, for example, you have to forget the politics because the political, the, the life of the politicians are much shorter than that. And that's why I think okay. we would be much better off without this. John, you talked about um, a college of teachers, college of teaching, which is music to my ears and plays into work that some of us are engaged in in this country at the moment. That's part of the system that you think you need to, to drive yes. transformation. Is it enough on its own? Or are there other things? I have the same question to both of you. What, what is the framework that needs to be in place to support sustained, long-term improvement in teaching? Well, I certainly think it's the missing link at the moment that we don't have. And the notion of you know, change at the moment is measured in election cycles. And whilst we do that, we do need a tempering body that has a long-term <laughs> agenda. And can implement. But are we prepared as a profession to let the expert teachers run it? If we're not, it'll just become another quango. Thank you. <laughs> well, you, you know, one way to look at this question is to, to ask that how Finland has remained immune to the germ, the, the, the global virus of, uh, um, within education system. I, I think one, one of the things, that, one of the advantages that Finland has regarding its teachers and teaching force is that we have all the teachers are holding a research-based master's degree from our universities. And it's, it's not only that you need these skills when you work in a school, but it's particularly important for this germ and, and try to stay resistant to the global influences because many of our teachers, I would say probably most of our teachers who are working in the school system, they read research. They read John's book easily, although it's written in, in Australian English. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, people can read scientific things, and they, they know what's going on. And that's why, you know, some of the, many of these things that are, you can see now around the world infecting education systems, like, you know, overuse of standardized testing. These are something that the most Finnish teachers, they understand these things because they can read and follow the literature, not only in Finnish, but also in English. And I think it's important to, in the future, to, to have a teaching force, these professionals who are able to, just like medical doctors, that they know what's going on. The medical doctors don't take any crazy idea if somebody is proposing how to do the open heart surgery because they want to rely on evidence and science and their practice. And I think teachers have to do exactly the same. Well, thank you very much for reading. Let's, let's begin to invite some questions, thoughts, conversation from, from the floor. And I'll try and pick up two or three ideas at the same time. Um, and I've got a gentleman in a pale blue shirt in the middle of there, I think has realized who I'm pointing at. Um, thank you. It's a question for John. Uh, you said that every teacher can show pupil progress and be asked to be left alone. If pupil progress is the wrong test for high impact and passionate, then what's the right test? Okay. So, so test for passionate. Let's take two or three. Um, lady yeah. in the middle there, two, and then gentleman in front. Right. So. Okay. Um, you said that other factors in society or policies play a crucial part, too. Now, I wonder if either of you gentlemen have considered the fact that Finnish has got the easiest spelling system in the world, or one of the two best ones, along with Korean, and that English is at the complete other extreme. In other words, teachers in English-speaking schools have got very rotten tools to do the job with, especially for literacy, whereas the Finnish teachers can do it in a very short time, and if you can learn to read and write easily, that makes an enormous difference to how you can learn everything else. And I think this is something that English-speaking countries really need to consider. Do we need to use a spelling system or exactly as it was 400 years ago? Because Finland modernized its spelling. Okay, and and I think that's something that you really need to consider. You can, you can tell us. And gentlemen here, yes, thank you. <laughs> really quick one. Um, England's going for removing the middle tier of education. I think it's 
the first in the world of a developed country to do it. I'm very interested to know the panel's thoughts on whether that's going to be successful or not, taking away local authorities or at least diminishing their roles. Okay, so we've got measuring passion, spelling system, and mediating tiers in administration of education systems. John first, then Pazzi. Oh, good. It means I missed the spelling one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, passion for testing. Hey, guys, we, we, surely you don't need more tests. I certainly have a very, like, my background is measurement. I'm a psychometrician. That's my, my business, and so I'm not opposed to the notion of testing. But what I've been doing, certainly in my last 10 years in New Zealand, was to try to turn that equation on its head and stop putting more thermometers up the bums of kids and start giving more assessment for teachers so that they can know on a regular basis the kind of impact they have so they can change what they're doing. Now, I don't see that in many systems, and that's what I'm, I was obviously quite um, attuned into trying to do, is to help teachers have the resource to know when they have an impact about what and with who. We've done it for the last 10 years. We have a system where in our high school and our primary schools it's voluntary. 80% of the teachers in schools are adopting it. You might find that remarkable that they actually like assessment, but they do like it when it's about helping them. And that's what I want to turn around. So if that's the case, and feeds into the, to the notion of which teachers are having the higher impact, and how you can have a collaborative discussion in the staff rooms, then I'm with it. Your turn. About the spelling. Why not? Yeah, why not? Well, let, let me tell you an anecdote about Finnish language, because there was a, there was a, a reference to this. Before the first OECD PISA study was published 11 years ago, December 2001, there was a common belief, actually there was a, it was more than that, everybody knew that wh whoever had been exposed to Finnish languages, that our language is probably the most difficult language of all to learn. Um, there are some British people who have tried that and failed because it's so complicated. But after PISA, now during these last 11 years, there's a kind of a theory that make it maybe Finnish children are so good in PISA because Finnish language is so easy to learn. Because it's a kind of a phonetic language. And as you said, that we have changed, that the language has changed, but it's still very complicated. I don't have any, any recommendation what you should be doing here or in other countries in terms of reading. But I fully agree with you that if you look at the OECD PISA, at the kind of a nature of the test, test it really favors those countries and those children who learn who are very good in, in reading, who understand uh, you know, what they read. And that's why I think Finland has an advantage in this, because we have been traditionally, our children have been good readers. But it's, there, are, there are many other things than uh, just the kind of a nature of language. One of them is that Finnish kids watch a lot of TV, and all, all foreign programs are subtitled, so they have to read and listen to the language, which is an interesting thing. Do we pick up middle tier yeah. um, managing systems? Certainly the work that I've been doing in um, schools with respect to leadership is that we have this false belief that leadership makes the difference. And I have a hunch the answer isn't one, probably isn't two, but let me go to two. Certainly in schools that are having evidence of high impact and doing a great job, leadership is not that critical. Indirect leadership's powerful. But my goodness, in schools that are, it's all about leadership. It's all about the middle tiers of leadership. So I think we have to be careful about generalising, and I know I'm going from one just to two, but certainly in the schools where you want to make the difference, where you want to change, leadership is all, at all levels. Finnish system, leadership? I think we, I think we rely heavily on, on leadership because Finnish system is very decentralised. Most of the decisions like curriculum planning and also evaluating, assessing students, everything takes place at the level of the school. So you have to have a good leadership in a school, otherwise this system wouldn't work. Okay, thank you. I am going to get in a plug at this stage for a really good novel by a guy called Diego Morani. It has the title Modern Finnish Grammar, and it's about a man who loses language and he's learning Finnish. Okay. I strongly recommend it. Right, um, let's have some more questions. Right, at the back, uh, there's someone waving at me. In fact, there are two people at the back. Uh, lady first, gentleman next. Um, hello, thank you very much for the talks, they're really interesting. Um, one of my jobs is to organise um, CPD for the teachers in my school. And I was really interested, and have been interested in the idea that it's not about comparing yourself to other schools, it's about looking at the differences within a school. Um, so, I've got a few days to play with each year to provide inset, as we call it in England, um, for our staff. 
Could I be a bit cheeky and ask you for advice of how I could organise that time so as to share best practice in school? What kind of practical activities should I organise? Thank you in advance. fantastic question. Thank you. And the gentleman at the end of the row. Hi, I, I'm a head teacher at a school, um, 1,500 kids. Um, single question, really, for John. How do I put the high-impact teachers at the heart of making school policy and, and driving schools forward? Which is a very similar question, in a way. Could you, could you, could you sorry, we didn't quite catch can the I, question. Can I start, okay. How do I put the high-impact teachers at the heart of driving the school forward? How to put high-impact teachers at the heart of driving the school forward? There may be strong similarities between those questions, actually. Any other questions from, actually, teachers, head teachers? Are you a teacher? You're going to pretend to be for this question, even if you're not, I can tell. Uh, just this is according for the Finnish system. What kind of impact do you think it makes on the child's education, the fact that in Finland they start later? Okay, start school later. Okay. Shall we start there and then come back into teacher development? Pazzi, do you want to go first on that? Sure. Yeah, I think you refer to the fact that in Finland children go to school when they're seven. That was the question, yeah. Um, well, it's probably difficult to show exactly what, what, what is the impact of this, but I can tell you why we are doing, why Finnish ch children start schooling later than others. I think we have a very strong consensus among our people that play is a very important part of children's development. And that's why we, uh, you know, if you look at the, uh, the daycare system in Finland, which is not under the education, uh, it's uh, almost only play, music and play, and, you know, they're hanging around, learning themselves to, you know, who they are and what they want to, what, want to do. And there, there has actually been only one reason to reconsider this uh, school starting age in Finland, and that's the uh, economical reason, because uh, in Finland, people enter labor market too old. And that's why there have been some people saying that if we start schooling at the age of six or five, Finnish people go to work earlier. But other than that, it has nothing to do with the learning that they would be progressing better. I, I think the evidence, again, from the international studies show that it, the school starting age, age doesn't have really a difference into students' learning. Or maybe, John, you want to comment on this? My understanding is that what Finland also has is some really strongly developed careers advice and guidance systems that at the other end of the school system sure. are picking sure. people up sure. a lot. Yeah. But yeah, John. Look, my only comment is who, who, who decided that it should be fired? It's, I'm sure there's no rationality, and, cer and certainly I don't see. Who decided five? The sound, I'm going to see to that. The sound's bad. It sounds bad. Let's put it a bit further up. Try that. Who decided five? I don't see where that happens. When I look around the world, I certainly look at the countries that start later. They have much less problems in terms of classifying kids with reading problems and so on and so on. And I think we may have got something wrong in terms of what we do. Now, my interest isn't the age. My interest is what we do with them. And I think you've answered that. Yeah, all right. Okay. Well, I come back Can we come back? Can we talk? I think they're really...
we, we know that teachers live in the present. Um, that's what Lordy showed 30, 30, 40 years ago, and that's a reality. And certainly the work that we do in schools to how to get better is to ask that first question. Let's have a discussion about the evidence you have of the impact you're having on kids. So notice I didn't say what that, how to measure that impact. Because my argument is if you use a test score, you failed. If you don't use a test score, you failed. There's a hell of a lot more than that. Having a debate about that opens up the discussion. And one of my worries about my own work at the moment is teachers at schools are using visible learning. And I'm saying to them, what's the problem you're addressing? And the problem is about, in many schools, about the nature of that evidence. And that, obviously, that has to be a collective. Obviously, it has to have trust in terms of saying, not good enough. How do we drive it up further? And so that's what we work on very much. How do governments trust teachers? Um, I, like I'm absolutely fascinated why most Western countries have followed the German mentality, and I think it's absolutely intriguing. And my argument at the moment is, um, in trying to unravel this, is 30 years ago we had a government that was invested on improving schools for the outcomes of kids. Now we have governments that are, are very vested in demonstrating to parents and voters that their money has been well spent. Otherwise, why would you have discussions about choice in schools and academy and uniforms and fewer kids in the classrooms? It's a massive change, and we have to help governments who have that as an issue to try and turn it around. And that's uh, my argument to politicians is change the debate from standards and getting all kids to a certain level to this notion of every kid deserves a year's growth for a year's input. That's my aim. Yeah. Can I ask you, you asked a question of how to get better. Uh, you, and you're a teacher, right? How many years you've been teaching? Ten years? Obviously, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think there, there, was a, there was a directly question uh, whether Finnish government trusts uh, our teachers. Yes, they do, and not only government, but everybody in our country trusts teachers. And you know, one of the measures uh, that we have is that our Treasury or Ministry of Finance is doing, conducting a survey every year to, to what extent taxpayers rely and, and trust the public institutions. And, and there's over 80% confidence level among taxpayers to our public school system. And uh, this means teachers, of course, which is the highest, uh, by far the highest. Next one is police, and then there's all sorts of other things, and parliament has something like 20, <laughs> like, like here probably as well. But you know, this trust is all over the place in, in Finland uh, regarding teaching. And what is, I think what is significant also in our culture of schooling is that it's not only that the government and parents, they trust teachers, but teachers trust their students and principals trust teachers and so on. So it's a kind of a culture of trust where all these uh, things are taking place. There are no seats on the next flight to Helsinki. <laughs> John's uh, incredibly expert on classroom processes and has pointed out that I've not taken any questions from this side of the room. So are there any questions from this side of the room? Yes, a lady here. Can I just the mic? Wait for the mic, it's probably easier. And then I'm going to go further back to that gentleman. Could I just ask about uh, the role of uh, the importance of time and protecting teachers' time in school so that they are able to reflect and to collaborate and to... Um, uh, to, to um, look at their, their pupils' um, progress and determine whether or not they're making an impact and learn how to do that. Is this something that is um, protected within the Finnish system at all? I mean, it's... Okay. And then, um, gentlemen, near, yes, there. Hello, this is mainly a question for Pasi Salberg. I'm interested if there's anything in particular about the relationship between teachers and parents in Finnish education that you think contributes to the success of the system. Okay, and I'm going to take one more question. Right at the front, in here. Um, thank you. One of you talked about the research and the Finnish teachers that are able to um, read uh, English and Finnish uh, academic research as far as their teaching skills is concerned. Uh, my question is to you, because I've, I've, I've heard that question before. Um, teachers are, have obviously little time, and how could 
they managed to read so much research in a very little time that they have and really apply it. Uh, how? How does Given it the work? <laughs> how does it work? Okay, so I think we've got time, collaboration, and time. Hasi, you go first. Okay, all for me. Thank you very much for well, this. Well, bring John in. Uh, yeah, I, I think this time question is important. And, and you know, if, if you look at the, the international comparisons in terms of how differently teachers experience work in terms of time in different countries, you, one thing you realize is that Finland seem to have a system where teachers' uh, required teaching load is uh, relatively uh, less than in, in many other countries, certainly much less than in the United States and here in England, which means that the school days, um, if you look at the working day of Finnish teachers, on average, of course, they are different, different people, uh, they, they have more time to do other things than just teach their, their children. When I was a teacher myself, I was a, a, uh, I was a teacher of mathematics and science in middle school and high school. And I, I typically, my typical day was four 45-minute lessons of work, which means that I have time to do other things with other colleagues uh, or by myself. It's not, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say that all Finnish teachers read research literature or John's book uh, every night. Uh, but <laughs> you'll probably regret this. But uh, it's a kind of a common thing of, of you know, maintaining and, and upgrading your professional uh, uh, learning. The, how te the question was how teachers, how parents, uh, how parents and teachers relate to one another. Um, I think we have had an issue, but uh, particularly I remember when I was a teacher myself, that it was sometimes difficult to convince parents to, uh, you know, come to school and uh, do things together with uh, teachers. And it's probably indicating s some of this kind of a confidence that most of the parents, at least that time, felt that they, um, they have to what teachers are doing. I wouldn't argue, I wouldn't say that the, the teacher and home cooperation has too much to do with the uh, success or impact of teaching and learning and the, the, the measured results in Finland, it has to be something else. But one thing that is, is clear is that the, the most of the families today, they trust and rely on what teachers and schools are doing in Finland. I just want to make one comment on time because one of my pet dislikes, I understand the issue of time, but here's the bad news, guys. Those teachers who are high-impact, passionate teachers have the same time as the rest of you. Okay, thank you very much. Right, okay, I'm looking... Time, time is a really important point to make there, because I'm looking at the time. Um, I'm going to say some things, if I may, to draw this session to an end, but there's something really important that I want to say first, and I'll forget if I don't. The Institute's fabulous today. It's crawling with people. It's lively places. There's one space that has been undervisited. Okay. In our student union, we have a um, digital making room, and we have some students from London schools doing some really interesting app development and IT development, and it's somewhat undervisited. So can I ask you to do two things? First of all, make sure you look at the digital making room before much more time passes. And when you have looked at it, tell somebody else to go and look at the digital making room. I think they'd appreciate it, and, and, and we would. I found this session absolutely fascinating, a real treat. Um, I've learned a huge amount. One of the things that we wanted the London Festival of Education to do was to broaden perspectives, to extend minds. And I think this has been a rare treat to listen to John and Pazzi. Thank you ever so much. Really interesting session. Will you join me in thanking John and Pazzi?